people that the, the pandemic didn't change my life all that much so i'm, I'm fine <laughs> yeah. that's amazing i like i like when people come on and brag about how well they're doing during the pandemic because it yeah. makes me feel like I, I not that i'm not that it like affected me that much i mean I, I haven't been out in a year i didn't get to see anybody but i don't know like as soon as i found out that our own government had no fucking clue what was going on i'm like oh good it's just for me, it's not, I'm not not doing the work for a change. It's like I, the cyber. I, don't mind, I don't mind the not seeing people part. I just yeah. don't mind it. No, no I know what I, you mean. When I, you know, I uh, I see my kids. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, we we have lunch outside, you know, somewhere. I'm in California, so the weather's nice. I can go hiking oh. all the time. Yeah, and, and I write, so I don't, I don't see people when I write. I sit in the room and I write. So uh, so my girlfriend right. and I we have it, our life is is just fine. Oh, and congratulations, by the way. You just got engaged, right? Yes, I did. Yes. Yeah, congratulations, man. That's awesome. Like, was, that a, was that a pandemic thing where you were like, well, we're together anyway, so. <laughs> no, we, were, no we, were, we, we just haven't been able to actually figure out how to do it yet because the world is still weird. But, um, yeah. but no, we wanted to do this for a while. We've been together. We got together uh, two years after my divorce, and uh, we've been nice. together ever since. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it, it, was, it was that was one of those things that like uh, it kind of disrupted like every wedding, obviously, that I that I knew. What's great is people who went ahead and had their weddings anyway. I was like, oh, thank God I don't have to go. But like my really close yeah. friends who were like <laughs> who were yeah. sane enough to like Herbert, I was like, we're going to get you that. Like I felt like emboldened to get them the wedding. Like we're going to make it happen. But, you know, yeah, um, that's cool, though. That Yeah, I'm a little jealous of the California thing because I like to bike and uh I, I did that stuff during the summer when it hit and then the winter came and that was like when the serious level of like, Oh, I'm inside forever now. I'm in Jersey. Yeah. By the way. And I've had so, friends in New York city who were stuck in high rise buildings and they couldn't even get in the elevator because of, you know, nobody was vaccinated. It's a scary time. Right? Yeah. You know, but we're getting yeah. out of it. We're getting out yeah, of I know it. it's, it's great, man. I got my first shot. So I already talked to my manager and I was like, just start booking. I'm games. one shot in. I'm one shot in, and uh, two two weeks from now I get the next one, and then I'm done. Cool. Yeah. How'd you handle the first shot? Was it did it was it okay? I got yeah. the Pfizer shot. It uh, felt like felt like nothing, right. and then the next day when I woke up, if I touched my shoulder where they shot it, that that was a little sore. Other than that, it was nothing. Right. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Same same for me. It wasn't too much. It wasn't too bad. Maybe like the last couple hours felt a little weird, but I slept through it. Oh. Yeah, so that's not too bad. Um, yeah. So I want to get into you. I mean, you, you've had a, a, like an just an incredible career. Like I've, I, I knew who you were beforehand, but then like of course coming out of the podcast, I like Googled you a little bit. No oh offense. yeah, uh, and oh my god, I mean, just it just went on and on, dude. It is just the amount of amount of people that you worked with and stuff. But what I want to know is, I always ask people who do this kind of thing: was it was it the writing that came first for you, or were you like interested in something else before you got into that, and then you fell into the writing? Because I, I find when I interview writers, sometimes they kind of like they like they didn't know they want to do it, they had a knack for it, and then stumbled into TV writing and stuff. I always, I always wrote, even as a kid, I would write shows for the neighborhood kids or, you know, my school or something like that. But it was always with the intention of performing what I wrote. Wow. I didn't separate the two. And so I really started out as an actor mm -hmm. and I started writing the plays uh, with Jane Milmore, my writing partner, uh, 46 years. Um, we did, uh, we, we wrote plays to give ourselves something to act in. Mm -hmm. And then the plays took off, had a life of their own. The plays got me brought out to California to write for Bob Newhart. And then I entered the sitcom world and right. I've been doing that forever. And then I, we've been, we alternated going back and forth uh, on the TV hiatuses. When the shows stopped filming, we would mm -hmm. go back to New Jersey and we put on an original show that we had been writing throughout the previous year. Right. And I have a, a company of uh, very talented people I work with, uh, the Van Zandt Millmore Unofficial Repertory Company. Um, these are just great actor, great comedians, really. 
mm -hmm. um, who I, whenever we'd write a show, I would call him usually in January after, as we're finishing touches on the show. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, okay, I need you in May. I need you in May. What am I playing? You'll find out when you get there. So <laughs> that, we, we all get together. And uh, I've been very lucky because they've been terrific and uh, they make the shows much better. Wow. And I'm sorry to hear about your writing partner, by the way. I know that it was a, a you know, but that was, that was, that's gotta be rough. I have same thing. I feel like a writing partner, I have a buddy of mine who we write together all the time and uh, it would just be, you know, it, it's, you, you develop like a, you know, camaraderie and you just know each other's uh, like sign language basically and everything like that. And, and it's, it's just a great thing to have. Yeah. We met in high school uh, in, in New Jersey. I was, I was middle school in high school. She was Keensburg high school. Oh my God. We met in a drama competition at the Barn Theater in Rumson, which isn't there anymore. Okay. And um, the producer, Lois McDonald, put Jane and me into a Neil Simon comedy, uh, Star Spangled Girl, mm -hmm. when, I, when I was a junior in high school. So that's where we met, and, and uh, we've been, we were together ever since, and she passed away a year ago, uh, February. Oh, that's incredible. And so yeah. you, went to, you went to Middletown High School then in New Jersey? Because I'm, I'm in town, I went to Tom's River. High school. Oh, my, my cousin Kenny was, was down there. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. It's my, so crazy, man. My cousins, uh, my cousins lived right, right by Ocean County College, and we would go down there every every summer. We'd go out on Barnegat Bay and and have, yep, hang crabbing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's where I, I grew up. I grew up I, in Tom's miss, River. One thing about this pandemic, not just one thing, but I, I miss being back in Jersey for the summer. That I, I really miss. And uh, yeah, you know. That, it's funny that you say that too, because my friends and I, we've all like, I, I've lived out in California for two years and there's something about a Jersey summer that is in us when it gets close to that, you yeah. know, time of the year. It's just, you got all this energy. Tom, our, my producer is from Red Bank. Oh, I was, I was born in Red Bank. Oh, there you, <laughs> there you go. That's uh, Red Bank's fucking, that's the one thing I think that, so I love the Jersey Shore sh summer, right? Like that's just, uh, you can't beat that kind of stuff. Boardwalk, the whole shebang, the beach. But like Red Bank ha is the art place. You know what I mean? Like I wished our downtown area in Tom's River had an art scene and it doesn't. Not the way Red Bank does. So was it yeah. was it like that when you were younger there too or no? No. And when I was younger, you would take the, the bus from uh, Campbell's Junction in Middletown into Red Bank where the, the highlight of the day was going to the Woolworth hamburger counter and having your lunch. Oh which was God. great, by the way. Yeah. And then we'd we'd walk around to all the uh, all the half closed stores, and we'd end up in Marine Park, and uh, that was our that was usually our Saturday. If you were if you were in junior high or high school in, in Middletown, that's what you did. Wow. And, and we had the we had the Carlton Theater, which is now the Count Basie Theater, and um, I, I remember uh, getting kicked out of there. My 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 brother and his friends were forced to babysit me and my sister every Saturday. My mother would dump us at the Carlton, the Count Basie, and we'd watch movies. Oh, wow. So we always sat up in the balcony. And I remember Tommy Besh, who lived behind us, he got a, one of the big, big things of Coca-Cola, and he put it on the edge of the balcony, and in the middle of the film, he pushed it off, <laughs> splashed all over the people below us, and we got kicked out on the street, and we had to kill Tommy. <laughs> Because you know, double feature cartoons, the whole thing. So my mother never right. found out. We just had to kill time until five o'clock. Until she holy shit, <laughs> yeah. that's awesome, man. I, I went to my first drive-in during the pandemic because I've, I'd never been to one before. Nobody ever opened one, and then Jersey. I think New Jersey has like a high number of old drive. -in. Like they still have the 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 stuff you know left over from when it was available. Yeah. Our drive-in was uh, is now a uh, drive-in in Hazlitt is now a movie theater and a Costco. They just you know they took out all that land and, and did that. Oh, but wow. we used to go there. There was a play a, a swing set in front of the screen, so you, your kids would in their pajamas would run around on the on the thing. I never and knew that. You'd go and sit in the car and you'd fall asleep while your parents watched the Wild Bunch. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't quite, you know, but uh, anyway. That's so, awesome. Yeah, I, I miss drive-ins. Uh, I, I used to love those. It was a blast, man. I was having, so like, I was outdoors with a bunch of junk food and these gigantic, I was like, why don't we do this in the summer all the time now? This is ridiculous. Yeah. I think they're back. I think they're going to stay back. I hope so. Um, and so you were talking earlier about, you said you, you were one of the writer who liked to perform their material and you worked with a lot of comedians though, but you never wanted to do stand up, and ne you never wanted to see your stuff. Like you never wanted to write a, you know, I, 
I always assumed I would do it, and I mm-hmm. never did. And I had a manager who used to force me to get a you know notebook and write things down and everything. Yeah. And I just uh, there was something I, I've I've always been a fan of it. And most of the people that we have written for are comedians. Yeah. Um, but the only time, and, I, and I've emceed things where it's sort of doing stand up, but not really. Mm-hmm. And uh, to 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 shut up my manager one time, we wrote a show called The Little Quickie, where I played a stand up comedian. And in between each scene, a, a, a straight man and I would do our act, mm-hmm. and uh, it was fun. I enjoyed doing it, but I never pursued it. Never pursued it. Wow. I, I don't know why. I really don't know why because it, it, it's fun. But there's I, still time. I mean, you can still. There, there's guys who like. Uh, this man, you know what's crazy? Have you noticed like the thing where like the dudes who, uh, I guess, who were in the '80s who kind of sucked at stand up, but they were phenomenal writers. But now that they've made some notoriety, uh, they all of a sudden they have a special, and you're like, you still kind of suck, but you're just famous. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, yeah. no one's stopping them, so just go. I mean, I'm sure you'd crush if you went on stage all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 well, I, I tore around in a. With Jane and I wrote uh, 25. I think 25 plays together. And so mm-hmm. I've been touring around in this last one, which is the, the, the Boomer Boys musical, which we stopped when the world shut down. And we'll, right, start, right. we'll start up again, you know, the end of the year or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's four guys sort of doing a Rat Pack act. So we're I'm sort of halfway into stand That's cool, though. Yeah. Did you write, um, did, you, did you ever do, like, have you ever, like, had to punch up a, a con, like, a stand-up as, as far as, like, because I know you you did some stuff with Richard Lewis. You said you did some stuff with Bob Newhart. Um, yeah. Did you ever, like, strictly write for any comics coming up when you were younger? Like, because I, I, when I was coming up, I wrote for a few other comedians and stuff, or I mostly helped them with, like, um, anytime they had to do panel stuff, you know what I mean? Like, working their sets and stuff like that. Did you do a lot of that? No. Because oh. I, have, I have, I entered this business completely ignorant of how the business works. I knew <laughs> I wanted to perform. I didn't know how you perform. I didn't know where you go to do that. Okay. I, I didn't know how to get an agent. I didn't know how to do anything. So mm-hmm. I started doing everything myself. Wow. And once I started writing the plays, and the plays were discovered basically by people in in Hollywood who brought us out to write for for sitcoms. Mm-hmm. I just went along. You know, I, I, we've been right. very, very lucky. I will say. And um, I've worked with some phenomenal people, really phenomenal people. And I've learned a lot from stand-ups, but I That's haven't, incredible. but I have I've never written for them. Um, the, uh, uh, there was a, a, a writer's assistant on, on one show I did. And the, uh, the guy that invented, oh, I'm going to blow the joke. So I can't even tell it now. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, now you got it. I got to know what it is. <laughs> Uh, I can't remember what he was. But, uh, there was a guy who died, and we were in the uh-huh. writer's room doing something. And the guy who died invented uh, he, he, some oh. movie theater thing. Right, right, right. And the, the writer's assistant just m- out of his mouth came, and they said the funeral will be at 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 9 o'clock. <laughs> we all started laughing. So we got on the phone with The Tonight Show, Mm-hmm. And we sold the kid's joke to their to their staff, and the joke was in Jay model Jay Leno's monologue that night, and it was it was phenomenal. But I I I don't even I wouldn't have even known how to do that if somebody hadn't picked up a phone and made a phone. Call. Right, that is funny. But that's sometimes that actually works to people's benefits though. When you start out without knowing like what you're supposed to be doing, you just wind up striking, you know, gold anyway because you either don't know how hard it is or you're just like I'm just going to do it on my own. Yeah, I, I, I found that nobody knows anything is what the, 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 the thing I've learned through the entire career is nobody really knows how anything works. You just sort of, it happens. You know, yeah, everybody, yeah. everybody, anytime I talk to students, they're always sitting there with a pad and pen wanting to know the formula. Of how, do right. I get on, how do I get on a staff? How do I write a script? Uh, there's four million answers to that. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah, there, there is. And it's, and it's, and it's always hard to kind of like steer somebody in that direction. Cause I feel like most times when people ask you those questions, they want a magic answer. You know what I mean? They're like, there's gotta be a, there's a, there's a secret way to get good. Right. Yeah. And you're just like, no, <laughs> no. It really comes down to the, the, the people who are the hungriest that way just want to be famous. They don't want to do, yeah. good, you know, and I can't help you do that. 
Yeah. Well, you know, it's crazy. When I was a kid, I always thought I, I kind of like uh, associated things with uh, like feeling about a thing. You know what I mean? I, I'm not exactly sure why or what that is when I was younger, but like, but I thought writers felt like writers, right? I thought if you were a writer, you would feel like a writer. And I always wanted to oh. do that. And ha like, like, you know, when you see the Dick Van Dyke show, I always perceived it as like a feeling. They're writers. They knew they're writers and they had that confidence. Right. And then the same thing with Santa, whatever else. And then I realized uh, when I was starting writing for stuff or whatever, you know, when you feel like a writer, you feel like shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Where you're like, it doesn't feel good all the time until it's done. And then maybe it's well received, but even then you're still second guessing. Like, like it's crazy to me how, when I was a kid, I thought, well, uh, you know, I thought writing came easy to people who wanted to write. And it was, uh, it was a good feeling. No, I, I find that, uh, well, I'm never satisfied with anything I have written. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I see one of my plays, I'll, I, I hate watching my, my plays because I sit in the back going, that's the wrong, I wrote that wrong, I should fix that. I need to, yep. you know, and it, it's, no, it's no fun for me. One of the reasons, one, one of the nice things of always being in my plays is I don't have to stand in the back of the room and criticize it as it's going on. <laughs> <laughs> that's really smart that's actually a good uh, a good piece of advice yeah yeah um so you, you were talking about also early i wanted to ask you when you were younger you said you made the kids do the plays so were you 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 dragged like your your family your friends your neighbors and stuff like that into the plays and were you in them as well too like you were kind of orchestrating it all i was always in them i i even back then i was producing directing and acting and writing <laughs> And uh, I remember I almost killed a kid around the neighborhood because one of, we would always do these uh, uh, muscular dystrophy affairs, you know. Right. There'd be a show at the end that everybody pay a dime to, and Joni Besh or somebody and I would do some stupid act, mm -hmm. which was just improv and hitting each other with water balloons and stuff, whatever that was. <laughs> but there was one time, poor Danny Kemright lived around the corner. We, I decided one of the shows was going to be, we were going to be the Three Stooges. Mm -hmm. And I cracked a big clay flower pot over his head, got a huge laugh from the audience, and he's bleeding and had, ran home. That was the last time I tried that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's actually kind of precious because, of course, kids don't know that it's balsa wood, wow. you know, or anything like that. And you just went ahead and did it. Oh, my God. That's yeah, the, and, that's hilarious. I knew his mother, his, his mother wouldn't let them watch the Three Stooges. So it's right. Like, I'll show you how it works. Bam! Oh, yeah, that's been, that's. You know, <laughs> are you the reason why we can't have uh, Looney Tunes anymore on TV? Because they were afraid the kids might <laughs> might copy the. Yes, I'm, I'm I'm solely responsible for that. Apparently, I knew it. Uh, yeah. Did you put yourself in the starring role? Like, are you are you were you in the habit of when you were younger, just going like, "I'm going to be the lead," and you guys do whatever? Or did were you generous with your like? Uh... No, there was no question. I was, of course, I was the lead. Otherwise, why would I have done it? That's so great. I was just saying, it's weird. I never did, um, never wrote my own stuff, but like we would, my my friends and I, we were on the playgrounds, or whatever, because we had Nintendos when we were younger, like the first one, and like a, I guess I maybe I maybe I had an Atari. I don't even know, but we had Nintendos. So we would go and uh, wear like the cartoon character shirts and I would orchestrate that kind of thing where I would be like, well, I'm Mario because obviously, and then, you know, <laughs> Italian. Um, and then, you know, the heavy set kid was always the bad guy and the prettiest girl got to run up with me to the top of the slide. And you know what I mean? Like it was, it worked out that I feel like that's a, that's an artist or comic or actor thing where you're like, I'm obviously the best um, exactly. <laughs> you guys are all beneath me, but I'll come up with the whole scenario. And you wonder why people follow you too, by the way. And then you're like, oh, they don't have any ideas. That's why. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm the one coming up with the games. Uh, that's just crazy. So, it, so, but it was definitely, so writing was just in the cards for you from the beginning. You never wanted to do anything else. No, I, I didn't. Uh, I, I always thought I would, I never thought I'd go into television as much as I was influenced by I Love, I Love Lucy and Lucille Ball. And that's really the comedy I wanted to do. Yeah. I always thought I would be on Broadway doing my own plays. Right, and uh, and and I was influenced heavily uh, by by Woody Allen's movies. Started it, wrote it, yeah, you know, you know, that sort of my, thing. My grandfather was like a huge Woody Allen guy. So when I grew up, I like he he was actually kind of instrumental for me to like watch that kind of stuff because uh, I knew about comics and comedians when I was young, uh, super young, because they. Uh, he had Jackie Mason on and he liked Jackie Mason. So he'd watch that. And I didn't actually know what a stand up was, but like I saw him on stage, everybody was laughing. 
all the adults are laughing. I want to make a laugh. So I'd repeat Jackie Mason stuff um, or whatever. And then uh, like the, the Woody Allen stuff, like he, he loved letting me watch that kind of stuff. And Carson, huge fan. Cause when he, he yeah. was from England and when he jumped shit, he came to New York and he worked in film for a little bit and he did that kind of stuff. And he also uh, opened up several businesses for himself. And one of them was a wig shop and he used to work on Ella Fitzgerald's hair. And well, like, so he had this, like, like, like he just liked sharing that kind of stuff. And then it kind of ingrained, you know, into me too or whatever. Um, and that was, that was just kind of how all that started. Were you one of those kids who like, cause you said you liked Lucille Ball and those comedy icons. Were you ever like crushed to know too much about the series? Cause I remember being younger watching Lucy loving that show. And then somebody in my family, for whatever reason was like, Hey, you know, Vivian Vance and William Frawley hated each other. Right. And I'd be like, what the fuck? you know, <laughs> like, come on. Like I, I hated that illusion broken when I was a kid. That's funny. No, I, I, uh, I, I never, uh, to this day, I don't want to know the backstory of anything. I just don't. Yes, I agree. I completely agree. <laughs> and and I don't think people, I think people know way too much. I liked it better when the stars were, you know, separate from the regular people. And uh, yeah, you know. And um, no, I, no. With with Lucy, I there was something about her timing that re resonated with me. Yeah. And I studied. I mean, I was a kid, but I studied how she got a laugh. And, and then I studied the scripts because I was still writing and, you know, mm -hmm. so they, that show taught me everything really. That show taught me how to structure a script. That show taught me how to, to uh, do that kind of comedy, which was outrageous, but believable, not stupid outrageous. It was believable, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and because of her, I learned, she studied everything from Buster Keaton. So I went back and learned from him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I've, I've always been soaking up as many people as I can. Groucho Marx, big influence on me. Uh, Jerry, Jerry Lewis, although I, you say that and people go, oh, what's wrong with you? But no, Jerry I know Lewis, what you mean. Yeah, you know, yeah uh, people feel like say that now, but it's it's still like you, you have to just, you know, I mean, it's one of those things where like, I know what you mean. Where like, I lo like I know exactly when you said Jerry Lewis, obviously he's an icon. You know what I mean? Like you have to, and, and there's something you can learn from all those people regardless of, whatever backstory, personal flaw you may, they may have. Yeah, and when I ended up working with Martin Lawrence, when we did the Martin show, he reminded me so much of Jerry Lewis. It was crazy because what he would do that Jerry Lewis did is mm -hmm. you'd, write, you'd write him some sort of a gag and it was, it was supposed to last maybe 15 seconds, then you move on to whatever else. And Martin would take that 15-second gag and do it for three minutes straight. And it would stop being right. funny, and then you would start laughing again at the audacity of how long he was doing this. And it was very <laughs> much like Jerry Lewis, you know. So yeah. I, I always equate the two of them together. Did and, you have uh, a favorite show that you were writing for, like at the time? Like you, wrote, I mean, from I Love Lucy to Martin, uh, you know, for um, I mean, New Heart and all those guys. Like, did you have one that you really like? The one I had, end? the one I had the most fun doing. We got canceled quickly. Was uh, for Don Rickles and Richard Lewis called Daddy Dearest. Oh my god! And was, I, was, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I, but I love that Don's, Don's last show. Yeah, was, we got Frank Sinatra on as a guest star. That was pretty cool. That was his right. last sitcom. Everything about that show was was correct as far as I was concerned, except for the fact that it was at the beginning of the height of political correctness, and the critics hated us. The audiences were big, and they still canceled us uh, because they tried to. Once, you know, when I said, look, we're going to do a Don Rickles show, I want to do it right. I want to do yeah. what, you know, and they kept trying to soften it. The network kept trying to soften it and make him a kindly grandfather. And I was like, no. Oh, my God. So, and we had constant battles back and forth with the network. And we finally got the show. We proved through the uh, uh, those those research centers where they pull people in off the street and they show Oh, them. yeah. So we showed them the pilot and we showed them, I think, uh, an, an episode that, was it took place in a DMV and it was exactly the episode I wanted to do every week. Mm -hmm. and, and the network put it with two other episodes, which were a little softer. And the people, the people in the, in the research center loved our two and were okay about the other two. So I went to the network president and said, look, see, this proves my point. And he said, I don't care what those people have to say. <laughs> well, then why did we do that? God damn. I, so it sucks because I don't even know where I I've never seen, 
I know about that show because one, I love Richard Lewis, love Don Rickles. And yeah. so even when I was younger, you know, uh, comedians were like, just who I, I look, I wanted to know what they've done, no matter what it was. I didn't even care if it was a fucking, you know, commercial for cell phones, like Riser was doing for a while. I was like, I want to watch it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I saw, I never got to see a full episode of that show, but I did see somebody put up and I think they fucking took it down somewhere. Uh, out like behind the scenes stuff, outtakes, whatever they were. I, there's some of the funniest between Lewis and 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 Rickles, and just you can hear the camera guys cracking up, the audience watching, and and R there's one where like Richard is just pacing in the background because Rickles is just Frank going Bonin, off. And this is this was a brilliant move. Uh, my my producer Frank Pace, mm -hmm. he thought of doing this right from the beginning. He told the cameraman never turn the camera off. Because the second we would cut a scene, Don would start attacking the camera guy, the wardrobe guy, the people <laughs> in the audience. It was so fun. So, so the camera was always on Don. Mm -hmm. And we ended up taking, you know, the episode was maybe 22, 22 minutes long. We'd cheat it and make it 20 minutes long and then stick two minutes of outtakes at the end of every episode. They were just hilarious. Wow. And, you know, we had, and we, I pulled people out of left field. I pulled Kate Ballard from the mothers in law, put her on the show. Nobody mm -hmm. been hiring her for a while. I pulled Hunts Hall out of retirement, the Bowery boys, and I put him in the show. Right. And, you know, and it was fun for me because I was like, oh, I'm in charge. I can pick whoever I want now. This is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I, I got, I got in trouble because I, you know, everybody, everybody I put on the show was people were people that I had grown up with that I wanted mm -hmm. to work with, you know? So, Richard went on to a Howard Stern show and Howard just ridiculed him for all the old people that we were having on our show. And he said, who's who are you have next? Rose Marie and Imogene Coca. And it was pretty funny, except for the fact I was in negotiations with Rose Marie and Imogene Coca. So I had to, I had to sort of pull that back and do it. Okay. Oh, but Rose Marie, that would have been so great to have Rose Marie and Imogene Coca. Ro Rose Marie. Oh my God, dude. That's like, that's crazy that you just said that because I just, um, I have the whole collection of the Dick Van Dyke show, right? I think it's like, it's gotta be in like one of my top five all time favorite um, shows. Has to, be, has to be. She was a yeah. good friend of mine. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh my God, dude. Yeah. She is so, her and uh, Maury Amsterdam together. I mean, even when I was a kid, you just knew. That's, that's another thing too, is like when you're little and you under, like, even though I may not have understood the jokes at the time, but just watching them. And I remember I laugh as hard today as I did when I was a kid at those scenes. Yeah. But just because it's like the rhythm of funny, that's all it really, you know what I mean? Where they're just like, they're just funny, funny people. Uh, but I just saw her on, um, God, I think it was an episode of, uh, I think it was Caroline. And this is so weird that I'm even, but Caroline in the city, but like, I, I don't know. I was just up late and it happened to be yeah. on and she opens yeah. the door and it's Rose Marie and Maury Amsterdam. And I didn't even know they did like, but that's, that's crazy that you had like, uh, it's, 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 a yeah, we, we did our, we did an off Broadway show called drop dead and I took it out to LA and, and, uh, took about half the cast from New York with us. Mm -hmm. And then we added Rose Marie, Donnie Most from Happy Days. My first wife, Adrienne Barbeau, was was uh, in the lead in that. Barney mm -hmm. Martin from Seinfeld in Chicago. And, the, and, uh, and, wow. and we just, we all got, we all got very friendly and stayed friendly. And I put Rose Marie on the Hughleys and um, wow. something else with her. But anyway. Yeah, she was she was great, and I'm glad she lived to see her documentary. If you haven't seen that, you should watch that. Um, I, I was going to ask. I ha do you have anything to do with the doc? I, I have seen the documentary, no. and it was beautiful. But um, that was another thing that I thought was cool. She had like this last minute online presence, which yeah. I, yeah. you know, when like there's so much BS online and stuff like that. But I felt like uh, all her um, messages of love that people like showed her were just genuinely sweet. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I think I'd like shared at one point because it was so sincere. She was just yeah. touched by how many people shared it, loved it, followed her. I thought that was, that was really nice. Yeah. And the documentary is amazing because it is. It's great. It's great. I mean, just talk about somebody who had, a, it's like, you know, it's crazy. It's like her Betty white, um, uh, even Cloris Leach, like said, those are people that had been in show business when they were super, super young and just had these, I mean, even Betty white to this day, I don't know what she's up to or if she's okay or still doing stuff, but, uh, like one, they make you happy when you see them and they're so fucking sharp and that's insane. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had, I had talked to, um, um, I'm sure you know, you know, Ed Asner, right? Yes. I've worked with her. I, I, I talked to his daughter about coming on the show, whatever. And I, and I picked up the, 
I called. I called to talk to him just to kind of introduce who I am because I know it's, it's gotta be weird when like some rando wants you on, you know what I mean? And by the way, thank you for coming on, but you know, like, you know what I mean? Like he has nothing to prove to anybody. Oh, anyway. So I called just to whatever, but I was looking for his daughter at first and then he picked up the phone. You don't expect it. Mm-hmm. So I asked for his daughter and then he, she was I stepped out of the time, but I guess he asked her husband uh, or whatever. And he was like, no. And then I went, Oh my God. I said, is this, is this Ed Asner? And, and he was like, yes. And I was like, well, I, I'm sorry, I'm an idiot. I, I wanted to say something early. He goes, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, I said, well, you know what? That's actually the only reason I wanted to speak with you. I was hoping you'd help me work through it. And he goes, uh, I'm 91. I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> it's like just getting roasted on the phone, but just so, so sharp and, and just yeah, super he funny. Yeah. And he's still working all the time, which is fantastic. Yeah. Well, he was in, um, uh, Cobra Kai, wasn't he? He was in the, he was the stepfather, I think, which was he's like, Kai, but he's also been touring around at a one man show that Ed Weinberger wrote about having prostate cancer. And, 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 uh, Ed Asner is the star. It's, it's, yeah. And as Ed Asner. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's crazy. I didn't realize he was doing the one. It, it's just, those guys are like, I mean, you know, they're just legends and, and it's crazy. And I love and that you're like, they, this, this is yeah. what they do, you know? And, and well, I mean, thing when I used to fight with the network, they would like, they punch hall. He's an old man. I said, he's been in the business since he was a teenager. Mm-hmm. He should know what he's doing by now, you know? Yeah. And and they fought me after, he only had a tiny little, you know, five line roll or something. They wanted me to fire him after the table read because he was too old, you'll never learn it. By the end wow. of the week, and I refused to do it. By the end of the week, they offered him two pilots. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's it's crazy to me that they never really learned that kind of stuff. Cause I'm like, how many, how many episodes, how many shows that wound up being crazy crazy successes started out with somebody at a network trying to uh scrap it going not having the vision for it it's like just yeah. trust the artists trust the entertainers trust the people that are doing it well that's the thing when i first started in tv you were you were hired to be the creative person mm-hmm. and they left you alone except you'd have the censor guy going you can't say damn or something whatever right right, right and then as the years have gone on it's everything is so micromanaged now yeah i always say that i don't care how bad a television show is Mm-hmm. I'm thrilled that whoever created that thing got it on the air because I know the, the the hoops they had to jump through to get it there. Yeah, it may not be what they set out to do, but they, at least they got it there, you know. And, yeah. and it's true, like most of the show, like even even way back to go, I Love Lucy, they filmed the show themselves. You right. know, Seinfeld was a late night, you know, throwaway show, and then suddenly it was a hit and nobody could yeah. touch. It. You know, so if if they just leave people alone, and that's what I think. We're lucky enough in the in the Netflix uh, Amazon Prime uh, era. Yeah, that's what they're doing again, letting the creators be the creators. Exactly, I and mean, that's the thing that's like it's crazy. You'd think the because ne- the networks are always suffering to the, to some extent or whatever, and all these other ca- like Netflix and all those guys are kind of taking off. And it's weird. You'd think they would understand that if you leave comedians alone and you let them just you know do whatever they want to do, they'll be fine. The yeah. shows will succeed, especially writers and all that other stuff too. And the other thing is too, uh, like I like I. We, I said before like i've been watching sitcoms all my life or whatever um but i guess like do you do you watch anything now that you absolutely love because i watched ted lasso and to me have you seen that yet Mm -hmm. okay so correct me if i'm wrong but i feel like that shows uh i felt like that was like what i used to almost what love and what like that kind of show embodies it i haven't seen anything like that in a long time do you think there's a reason other than the fact that like that you said the network's kind of gotten involved but like uh, I don't see too much of that anymore, and it's weird, and I don't know why. Well, as soon as the audiences started spreading out, everybody freaked out, and that's when the micromanagement started. I, I couldn't, if I'm producing a show right now, and I'm not, but if I was producing a show right now, mm-hmm. I can't hire a two-line walk-on role without putting that person on camera with three other people doing the same thing and then ship it to the studio for their approval to then ship it to the network for their approval, wow. you know, unless you, unless you're Chuck Lorre or you know one of those guys, uh, right. you, you know, you're just micromanaged to death. And uh, even way even way back when I started, when I first uh, sold a couple of uh, Jane and I sold our first couple of shows, I couldn't put together a writing staff if the person wasn't on the approved list even if I thought they were brilliant. And I kept thinking, but wait a minute, they're sitting in a room with me, not you. I should be able to pick who I'm working with. Right. But if they weren't on that list, man, or if the director wasn't on that list, you couldn't use them. 
Yeah, they seem to kind of recycle almost to ad nauseum the same kind of people over and over again. Like yeah. I guess, and and that make and that makes it harder to get people on that you haven't seen before, or some kind of fucking show that you've never seen before either. Um, yeah. And it, it just and I also feel like this is kind of shitting on my own generation a little bit and the ones that came after me. But like for situation comedies, I feel like you have to have grown up and had situations. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, it's, and, yeah. and I don't. And I feel like with this and yeah. you know everything else, it's like. Well, where are they coming? You know what I mean? Like, how could you possibly know what it's like to to uh, be caught in a situation that's uncomfortable and you're not immediately protected from? And where's the comedy in that? There's no comedy in getting, you know, a like on a fucking thing. So I, I think it's just weirder, you know. The best stories always come from the writer's own life. Well, I mean, not, yes. not necessarily the, the creator of the show, but the whole writer's right. staff. Somebody has a little story. And you, the, those are the ones that work. Norman Lear, his, all his shows were from his own life. And wow. you know they were classic, um, and, uh, and and it was funny. We worked on a show that was very popular called Yes, Dear. I couldn't oh. write it. It was the first time I did a show where I sat there and went, "I don't know how to. I don't know how to write this." Right. Because it was it was with all due respect to Greg Garcia, who wrote mm -hmm. it. He's a brilliant writer. I couldn't write that show. Okay. It didn't make any sense to me why a husband would be afraid to talk to his wife about he wants to play golf or something. You know, and, and at one point somebody turned to me in the writer's room and went, well, that's right, Bill, you like going home to your wife. It's like, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> so, I, you know, so we, we didn't last too long on that show. But uh, wow. talented people, the writing staff was all very good. I couldn't write that show. I, um, I kind of understand what you mean. I tried to watch. Um, I remember when that show was on the air and I would watch it occasionally but i didn't quite grasp it coming from it, i it's weird to me i know exactly what you mean coming from those other sh sitcoms and those other shows or whatever it seemed like uh i didn't understand the character i didn't understand that either like it kind of got like old very fast you know what i mean like and again like i know what you mean there were funny elements to it and i liked the con I, I can't think of his name now it's driving me crazy who was the comic that was that started it um <laughs> well michael malley was the second lead with i know michael malley <laughs> And the lead guy was Anthony. Oh, Anthony Clark. No, oh, no, thank you. no, it's Clark. Yeah, Anthony Clark. Yeah, I should know that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I I know exactly. But it was it was I was having a, a brain thing. You know, it's crazy. I know Michael Malley well because there was a cartoon series called Baby Blues made out of a comic strip that I liked, and Michael Malley did the voice of the lead. Um, whatever. Okay. And I wound up. I, yeah, I, I enjoyed writing for him and, and Liza Snyder because I, I I got them. They were. They were basically Fred and Ethel. Yeah, <laughs> you know? they totally were. And they were like the best part of that show. And the other stuff, I was just like, and the funny yeah. thing is, is like, I feel like Ray Romano's wife, Deborah, on, on Everybody Loves Raymond, that's somebody to be afraid of. But I feel like the girl from Mr. Holland's Opus, why would you be afraid of? Why, why would you not want to be afraid of your wife? It's crazy. Uh, so yeah, it was a little mismatched for me. But um, yeah, those are like, there's, there's nothing like... Uh, like out that's right that's right now that like sticks in my mind i love the drama stuff i like the you know some of the netflix shows some of the stuff comedians have or whatever but as far as like traditional sitcoms go it's it's weird no, the, 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 <laughs> one, the one where i was just i mean it's now now it's an old show because it's off the air but Shit's creek i thought was fantastic yeah that, that was I, that i love that could have gone on forever for me that was great yeah that was a brilliant uh, show with brilliant also brilliant people in it too when you were in those writers, my, my friends who run uh, the Connors, <laughs> I think they're doing a great job, especially from where they were and what what, what they had to go through. They have turned right. into a, you know, a really good show, and that that's one of the only network shows that night. I think the Goldbergs, I think, makes me laugh. Yeah, those are probably the only two network comedies I I even look at. What's What's crazy to me too is like, so they did a bunch of reboots, you know, all of a sudden out of the blue or whatever, and then, uh, um, but Roseanne. There's a couple that stood out as like whatever. So Roseanne, when it started, I rewatched it because I liked it when I was a kid. Um, yeah. You know, and John Goodman's, I mean, come on, J John Goodman and um, Laurie Metcalf, brilliant. I met Laurie Metcalf once. She's so nice, so hilarious. Um, but, uh, you know, it was a good show. But I felt like that, they picked up easily and right back where they left off. Even when Roseanne was, you know, when she was still on it, whatever it was, Roseanne, yeah. like they, uh, I don't know. I was well, like, I wish they, they could all do that. The, they brought back the same writers. That was, a, that was a key, you know. Right. A lot of time you have people doing reboots, and and it, their people had no, no connection to the original show at all, and they didn't get the, why the original show was as brilliant as it was. Right. And suddenly you're doing a, a, a terrible version of it, you know. 
Yeah, that was good. And I think there may have been a, one other one. And of course, now it's escaping me. But that I, that I thought like, oh, that wasn't a bad reboot, you know, whatever. But then when they bring the other ones back and the characters haven't grown, they're still in the same spot. I'm like, it's been 20 yeah. years. Somebody's got to, yeah. you know, <laughs> what are you dying yeah. their hair for? Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and then they have the, like the reunion shows that I wonder, like uh, Friends is doing a reunion show. And then I found out it's not, it's just that the actors are getting together. <laughs> they're not, nobody's writing anything. And I'm like, come on. Yeah. Um, so, so you run, when you won an Emmy, by the way, sorry, going back a little bit more now, uh, it was for I Love Lucy, right? It was for a, 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 a TV special about the uh, pilot of I Love Lucy that had been, okay. had been lost for 40 years. Make a long story short, we found it, went to CBS <laughs> and said, you know, we have the pilot. And they said, great, we own it. We said, yeah, I know, but you're not going to get it unless we get a special where we can show it on the air. Okay, and wow. Said, they said, we'll cut it down to 22 minutes and air it as a half hour special. I said, no, it's 35 minutes long. Give me a full hour and we'll fill in the rest with Lucy and Desi talking about, from film clips, talking mm -hmm. about putting the show together and we'll make it a full hour. And they, uh, they acquiesced. We, we whipped that together in three weeks. I had fantastic people working for us. Tom uh, Watson, a, a big Lucy uh, 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 he used to work for her, and, and he, he knows everything he needs to know. He pulled the, the right footage, and he was great. And we put together a great special. We got Lucy Arnaz to host it, um, and we were nominated for an Emmy. And I, I thought, well, you know, I made room on the mantle. And when we went to the ceremony, because, like, who's not going to vote for Lucy? Mm -hmm. Apparently the people who went to the ceremony. Yes, we got nominated. <laughs> we, lost, we lost to a Bob Fosse special. But, but uh, at the end of the show, when the, the heart, you know, the I Love Lucy heart, it was at the end of I Love Lucy, when the heart closed, it said produced by Billy Van Zandt and Jane Milmar. That was enough for me. That was, that was enough. And I got to work uh, a couple of years prior to that. I actually got to meet and work with Lucille Ball, which was a whole other thing. Wow. Um, which I go into in the book in, in a lot of detail. Um, and... Um, but it was it was it was great. I would I I enjoyed doing a special a lot. I gotta say, uh, that well, you answered uh, like literally. Thank you, by the way. You answered every single question I had about how hard it was to get it on the, <laughs> what oh, you had to do to negotiate the hour because yeah. I knew there was a sum in there, and you were just like, "Let me tell you real quick." Um, yeah, that's so. Um, what the the Lucille Ball when she I remember she like did some interviews with Dick Cavett and stuff like that. Was she? I mean, she seems very humble about her style of comedy, but was she, I mean, she seemed to be a genuinely funny person or was she just very serious she was, when she was, she was very serious. Uh, mm -hmm. It was very, it was so interesting. My friend, Ann Dusenberry, who was in Jaws two with me in the movie Jaws two, mm -hmm. she got cast as Lucy's daughter on the final TV show life with Lucy. Mm -hmm. And Ann called me up and said, uh, you know, you're the second person I'm telling after my mother, I got the job. <laughs> so I guess she knew my thing. So I got on a plane. I left Jane alone in New Jersey because we were opening up a theater, and she she you know she dealt with all the mm -hmm. while I was on a plane going to meet Lucille Ball. Mm -hmm. And uh, I show up, and uh, it was bizarre to watch her work because it was like watching myself in rehearsal to for one of my plays. She was really in control of everything. She was not hilariously funny she had to work she knew exactly how to work at being funny mm -hmm. but she wasn't spontaneously funny wow. and what she what she uh what she learned from was the audience once you had an audience there she could stretch things out she knew how to play the audience and it was really cool to watch but i was watching her rehearse and while she's in the scene with one person she's yelling to the gaffer which light behind her was out and that needed to be refocused and she was really on, on the ball wow. and she was, um, but she was, you know, you're afraid to meet your icons cause they're going to be horrible people. She was everything I wanted her to be. She was wow. friendly and fun and we connected right away. And, uh, to the point where cause I was only there to watch the first, you know, that first week mm -hmm. and, uh, to the point where the director pulled me aside and said, knock it off. I said, what? I said, She's telling you too many stories. My day is getting too long. So, but the next, the second week, uh, while I was there that first week, I saw a script for the, for the following week. And I saw that there was a delivery boy, uh, role in it. So mm -hmm. I went 
And I, I go into much detail in the book. It's a pretty funny story. But I went and I forced my way into the casting director's office and I insisted I had to have a, 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 you know, a, an audition. Right. And he said, well, we don't audition people for the Lucy show. You know, you, we look at people's tapes and we cast them. I said, I don't have a tape. I'm on vacation. Well, if you don't have a tape, <laughs> you, don't have a tape you don't have an audition, do you? So I went out to the local uh, video store and I rented Jaws 2 and Taps, which was another movie I did. Mm-hmm. And I slapped together a, a reel, and I walked into this guy's office. I, think about this now. They should have called the police and had me dragged away. I threw the tape at the guy. I went, there's your tape. Now give me my audition. <laughs> Holy shit. And the next day, I had an audition. Right. And I went in, and I read for uh, Bob, Car- Bob Carroll Jr. and Madeline Davis, who had created I Love Lucy with Jess Oppenheimer. They were, wow. they were producing this show and they had, and the script was written by Groucho Marx's son, Arthur. Everything was coming together for me. Oh. And um, so I, and I look on the call sheet or the, the sign in sheet and there were only two people reading for this role, Arsenio Hall and me. And <laughs> yeah, so I go into the audition and I thought, I'm never gonna get a chance to do this again. So I said, before we read, can I just tell, say something to you? And they said, what? And I just poured my heart out about how much they meant to me, how much they taught me. If somebody did that to me now, I would like get, get security, get them out. <laughs> uh, but they were very sweet. And then I read my whatever it was, four lines, whatever it was. I got my laughs and I went back to the bleachers to watch the rehearsal. Right. Uh, Anne came up to me and said, uh, Madeline just told me I could tell you, you know, you're, you're on the show next week. Oh. And... I showed up on Monday for that, that show and Gail Gordon was there and he stuck his hand out and said, welcome to the family. That was, that was a big moment for me. And, uh, I just loved, I just loved every minute of it. That's incredible. That's, and <clears throat> like, uh, it's just funny that you said you'd call security because that is kind of like a, I feel like those moments only happen like sparingly where like anybody, you're like, how come nobody did call security? <laughs> like, like, it's a weird thing where like, I've thought about doing that to people that I admire. And I'm like, maybe not. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe. It was a simpler time back then. I will say yeah. that. Yeah. And, and now you got to watch it when you're, when you're talking to people. Um, so you were, you were saying you were in Jaws too. Uh, yeah. did you enjoy, I just interviewed Carl Gottlieb. He came on. Uh, Love Carl. Great guy. Love Carl. Yeah. Great guy. And, 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 you know, people, if you look at his entire resume, this is a very well-rounded writer. Let me tell you. Yes. I Mother's Boys, Jaws, The Jerk. Those are not anywhere in any other category. Uh, he's, he's a terrific writer and he, he's doing great. Um, yeah. He, I, he, I was in the original uh, Jaws 2 Mm-hmm. Um, with a different director and a different writer and a different cast. Mm-hmm. And after three weeks, they fired the director, they fired the writer, and they sent the cast home. And I showed up in Florida uh, when I got the call, not knowing they had rehired all these different people. So I met Carl in Florida, where he had the thankless job of rewriting Jaws 2 as we shot it. Yeah, he, Every scene we were going to shoot, he was writing the night before. Wow. Crazy. And um, they, they were nice enough to let me, you know, I, 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 wrote, a, I wrote two or three little scenes for the kids on the dock and stuff. Okay. But, um, but he, you know, when I think back now, I, I, I keep telling him, I want to apologize to him every time I see him now. And Carl would be in his hotel room. There I am. Carl would be yep. in his hotel room writing all day long. He'd finally get out to go have dinner. And mm-hmm. every single person he passed at the hotel was connected with our film. So everybody he passed, how's it going, Carl? How's it going, Carl? How's it going, Carl? <laughs> he wanted to blow his brains out, I'm sure. That's right. And, uh, and, 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 and as far as sequels go, I think it, it was a great sequel. It wasn't yeah. the first Jaws. It wasn't Jaws. We all know it wasn't Jaws. Right. But, um, when, if, if And I started to say this when we first started. People don't care the, about the backstory when you see a, a movie or a play or a TV show. They just want to be entertained. Sure. But if you knew the backstory that Jeannot Swark, who directed it, normally you get a year to prepare a movie. Mm-hmm. He had two weeks. Oh, my God. And no scripts. <laughs> and no scripts. Right. And Carl didn't have a year and two to write a screenplay. He had overnight each scene. So the two of them pulled off an amazing feat. They really right. did. And, 
and I'm still friends with all those all those guys. Almost almost everybody in that film, we all stayed. You know, really. I was close. gonna say, did you guys wind up saying? Was it cool? Like, because that was that was like Jaws one. Obviously, is Jaws one. You know, whatever. Yeah. You, you know, you can't beat that. Jaws two, I enjoyed, and then it's weird because after that, you could tell how just the. Tra- <laughs> I mean, when you get to Michael Caine. <laughs> You know, and, and yeah. the wife, and the wife, and then you know they try to escape. That's just you can't beat that. It's funny. We did a. Uh, uh, I, I stayed friendly with all the kids from the film, and, and Tom Dunlop, who played Timmy, called me one night, and uh, maybe five years ago or so, said, "I'm coming out to L.A. I haven't seen you in a while. Let's have dinner." I said, "Great." So I said, "No, I was just going to have dinner with Gigi Morgan, who's also in the movie. I'll call her, and she'll come too." And he said, "Great." And then I hung up the phone. And I thought about it. And I started a, a, a game of telephone. Mm-hmm. And in 48 hours, we had every living member of the cast and the crew together in Westwood in a restaurant. And we just wow. all got together and had a great, great time. And it was right. like we knew each other the day before. It was just great. Lorraine, Lorraine Gary came, uh, the director, Carl uh, Sid Scheinberg, who ran Universal at the time. Everybody was there. And we just had a ball. So, yeah. Did- did Roy, did Roy Scheider run it coming out uh, too, or did you guys get to hang with him much, or was he kind of distant? And Roy hated being there. Roy did not <laughs> want to do that film. He, um, he 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 had passed away before we all got together. The, okay, but uh, on the original uh, on the shoot, he didn't want to be there. He had it in his contract that he had to be there, oh. and he had to turn down a bunch of good movies, including The Deer Hunter, to come do Jaws too. So he wasn't happy at all. Wow. If he wasn't, if he wasn't filming. He was the only picture I have of him. If he wasn't filming a scene, he was sitting in the parking lot of the Holiday Inn with one of those uh, sun reflectors under his chin in a studio getting tan. <laughs> Holy shit. And let I me mean, look at him. Look how tan he is in that Yeah. Film. But, wow. uh, but uh, Carl, uh, Keith Gordon ended up playing him as a younger Bob Fosse in uh, All That Jazz. He was supposed to. And he said, "Much totally different guy on that movie because he wanted, he wanted to yeah, be- he wanted it. yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's too yeah. funny. Carl, Carl's a sweet dude. It's funny because I was doing, um, you know, when you when you do one of like, I I written him, uh, I'd known him for a little bit because he was he wound up doing a comedy club uh, in Ohio, and I had been there then the following weekend. So I just messaged him and I was like, if you're still here, let me buy you lunch or whatever. But he had oh. he'd already gone back to LA. So then we kind of stayed in touch and, you know, uh, I'd interviewed him for some kind of thing I was writing or whatever. And then I was like, you know, pandemic hit and I had this and I was like, Hey, why don't you come on? And we'll talk. Yeah. So great. I have him on. And I, I, it's one of those things where like, I didn't know if I was taking up his time either. You know what I mean? So I was like, Oh, I'll let you go. And he's like, I could stay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all right. Because it was in the beginning. He was like, how long is the shot? And I was like, Oh, it's only an hour. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to bother you whatever. You know, and then, and I had him on, and it got to be the hour mark, and he was like, ah, I got time. <laughs> like, so he want to leave, which is cool. So we want to talk a little bit more. And then the other day I messaged him, and this is hilarious. It's hilarious to me. So I was like, hey, um, because we're getting like, um, I have to put some stuff together. You kind of know how it is. So it was like asking people for testimonials, like just a, one or two lines or whatever. And he goes, uh, no. <laughs> No response. He goes, and of course, I I totally understand that kind of curmudgeon kind of thing, right? So I was like, oh, I'm like, but I was like, is everything okay? And he goes, no, no. He goes, you're fantastic. I had a great time. I'd love to come back on. He goes, but as of right now, my obligation is fulfilled. That's <laughs> so funny. I, I was like, I like, I might frame that because that's the best, like, uh-huh. no uh-huh. response you could get from somebody. I was like, that is. My obligation. I want that on a shirt. Like my <laughs> obligation is fulfilled. Um, but he had a great story about because I he had he had a call. It's funny. Um, he uh, somebody who called him on the phone during the interview was from Jaws 3D. So I was just like, oh, that's just a weird whatever. So then she was like, hi, are you talking on speaker? So I'm joking around. I'm like, well, I'm like, let me know when Steven calls or whatever. And he's like, oh, he won't be calling. Uh, and I was like, why? And he, he had read this great story about why he doesn't talk to Steven. Not that he doesn't talk to you, but he goes, he basically explained it like some people get famous and they, they go on their yachts with Tom Hanks and you don't have a yacht. <laughs> it's just like, what a great way to describe like celebrity because you don't know people fall out. But I was like, that sucks, man. I'd get you a yacht. <laughs> like the guy who basically uh, saved Jaws and stuff. So you, so you have your your book, by the way, and I'd love to get to that too because I just just like to know a little bit. Yeah, yes, please. Seth. We actually have a picture of it, but that's I like that you're holding it up. Um, yeah, the car, Jane. Um, yeah, the car, Jane is a it's a 
it's a book I put together with all the story. It's it's a TV memoir of all the TV shows Janie and I either created or wrote for or produced. And every chapter is a different TV show that we worked on. Mm-hmm. So um, you know you can we wrote it. Uh, I wrote it as a as a beach read basically, so you can pick it up, read a chapter about Newhart. Three weeks later, you can read another chapter about Martin Lawrence, another chapter about Andrew Dice Clay. You know, so you don't have to you don't have to sit sit with it. And it's all these funny stories that I've been telling through the years of all the shows that we worked on. And uh, I kept journals on all the TV shows, so I would uh, I went back and had those to reference, and and so I could relive some of the horror stories and some of the yeah. fun stories. You know, but uh, I cover a lot of people in there, and I and I've been. Uh, very, very kind to some people I shouldn't have been. But, but <laughs> Wait, you, know, you can amend few, that. You can amend that right now. Let's get, let's get into it. <laughs> I get a few things in there. And, uh, and I was very lucky in the, in when it first came out. And this is only briefly, but I will take it. I got the number one on, a, on one of those Amazon lists. Uh, didn't last probably more than 15 minutes, but I was there. So uh, that's good that's enough. That's still for, huge, though. Yeah. And uh, so it was fun. And uh, people, the response has been terrific. Just so. Uh, How long did it take you to put it together? I originally wrote it or wrote most of it uh, probably about seven, eight years ago. Mm-hmm. And I shelved it because I was told by my lawyer I would get sued by too many people. Really? So I, I, so I said, well, screw it. Then I'm not going to publish it, you know. And, and then when I started putting it together, this I put it together this time because a friend of mine had written a, a, an anthology of um, Hollywood stories, and he remembered me talking about working with Lucille Ball, and he said, "Can I use that for my book?" And I said, "Well, let me clear it, clean things up first, and I did, and I took out some names, and I went, "Oh, that wasn't that tough. That wasn't so hard to do." And I took the next chapter of my book, and then suddenly I went through the whole book and went, "Oh, I can do this." Right. So I thought this would be the time to, to, to do it. And uh, right. so I, I finished it. Uh, Jane was still alive, and she got to she got to read it and edit it for me. And um, uh, she, picked the, she picked the pictures that are in the book. And, oh. and and she she had she had me change a couple things. She said, "I didn't I didn't throw a teapot at you. I threw a vacuum cleaner at you." I said, "Oh, okay, cool." So so it's all it was all. Quite- <laughs> the book is Jane approved. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, what were? Is there anything that you didn't put in there that you wish you had? Uh, there were a couple of shows where I simply couldn't remember enough to put enough stuff down. You know, I didn't have to make stuff up. So, I mean, these, these are not all the shows we worked on. I'd probably mm-hmm. say it's mm, maybe seventy-five percent of the shows we worked on, and um, and. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything I wish. There are a couple things I took out because I knew I'd get <laughs> I knew I'd get sued by somebody that I still wish was back in the book. But, Can you talk uh, about them at all, or you'd still get sued? No, I don't know. These people would sue. Okay. <laughs> would sue. Um, all right, we'll talk after. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but uh, but uh, people enjoy it, and they're waiting for a sequel. It's like, well, uh, maybe I don't know. We'll see. No, oh, nice, nice. Is is I was going to ask about a sequel too because you said you left. Like, there's some stuff that you didn't remember that you could have left out. Would you ever go to other people who maybe worked on those series and see what they could remember and kind of make a compilation and like thing? I thought I thought of doing that, um, but what I tried to do is approach it from the <clears throat> from the the age I was as I did each show. So you sort uh-huh. of follow me as the innocent going into television. And then becoming the bitter, horrible human being I am today. <laughs> so, uh, it doesn't come through, so I don't know if you're just putting on a show now or. <laughs> uh, it's all, all shake. It's all shake. Uh, and um, the uh, but I, I did hear. Uh, luckily, I heard from Richard Lewis, who liked the book a lot, and I heard from nice. Duffy, who liked the book a lot. And she said Bob Newhart liked the book, and Don Rickles uh. Blake liked the book, and Don liked the book because he had read a portion of it earlier. Um, so I feel like, okay, phew, you know, good. Mm, um, that's awesome. I, I honestly, I can't wait to read it, man. I'm going to, I'm going to grab it as, 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 as ASAP. Uh, Cause you know, it's crazy. Too. I love, I like the history of stuff. I love that like backstories of comedy and shows and all that stuff. And I, and I remember reading when I was younger, Rickles came out with a book. And then I think Bob Newhart, like not too long after that. And around the same time, Steve Martin had his book about stand up. And I don't think this, I don't think it was coincidence. 
each one of them is in each other's book because they were just oh. around at the and I and I like like I always wish there was like a concise timeline of comedy. You know what I mean? Who was around when? Who was around with who? Because uh-huh. I don't picture Newhart, Steve Martin, and Rickles in the same whatever. But in each of their books, they describe going to like Newhart would be in the main room and somebody would be Steve Martin oh. was playing around on the street and one of them had a kid and they were visiting. <clears throat> It's kind of like a, it's a cool picture to see when, when it's written out like that. So I'm it's interested. Funny, when, I, when I first worked with, with Bob Newhart, because he's so, so uh, family oriented in terms of his, his deliveries and stuff. Right. I remember him calling me and, and David Steinberg was one of the directors on the show. We, he uh. pulled us into his, his uh, producer's office so we could watch Andrew Dice Clay because he thought he was hilariously funny. And I was like, that doesn't go together to me. You know? Wow. No, yeah, but he thought he was brilliantly funny. I never told that's him. Amazing. But, but, yeah. Yeah. That, that is amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. I never, I never pictured that either, but that's the cool thing about, I think comedy and like standups and stuff like that too, is like you, you think, I think like, uh, like the audience or like regular people always looks for like a rivalry thing. Cause they're like, they're very attached to who they like. Cause they see themselves yeah. like it's like an avatar. And then it's funny when like one of your favorite comics is like, like that, if you love new heart and you're like, He's he's classier than that Dice Clay, and then you find out that Newhart's a fan of Dice Clay, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's incredible, yeah. dude. Well, I, I just seen it's been an hour, so I don't want to keep you any longer than than you're ready. But if you want to stay, you can stay, and we can talk more. But if you have an out, I can uh, wrap things up, and I can do ten more minutes. Ten Let's more minutes. Ten more. Let's do ten that's more. Fi- that's fine by me, man. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have anything I, that I can answer for you? Of course. Do I? I have so. I have so much I want you to answer for me. Um, ten, 10 minutes and dropping names. 10 minutes of dropping names. My producer just told me to say. Oh, okay. just keep going, rattle off some famous people. <laughs> um, do you, that, that is something that I'd like. Do, is there anybody that you, uh, that you worked with that you're intimidated by? No, no. That's phenomenal. Um, I, well, I answered so quickly. Let me, let me think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Lawrence scared the hell out of me. Just scared. Really? Me. Wow. Well, he, he literally would threaten to kill the writers if you didn't make the script funnier. And you believe oh, it. There was one time, this made me laugh, so there I am. Uh, yeah. I, I did little bit parts on the show. Um, there was one, I don't remember who the singer was. I mentioned it in the book, and I, don't, I couldn't remember the guy's name. There was mm-hmm. a singer who didn't show up for his guest star role <laughs> to, for the read-through. And um, I remember saying to... Uh, to uh, Martin's friends who were on the writing staff, I said, I can't believe how well Martin's acting today. You know, he, he didn't he didn't freak out that the guy didn't show up and he's being so professional about it. And they said, oh yeah, uh, I got to leave work early. I said, why? He said, because uh, Martin wants to find the guy and beat his brains in with a baseball bat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. okay. <laughs> wow. So when, when, when Martin read you, you kind of went, oh, let's make the script funnier. Yeah, yeah. I that's yeah. that that would, that would scare the shit out of me as well. I was I was almost thinking intimidated like star power, and you're like, no, we got our lives threatened. Uh, <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, I, uh, well, well, Lucy intimidated me until until I realized she was just one of the gang. Really, she treated. Yeah, yeah. Me the same. Um, well, we were all intimidated by Frank Sinatra. Nobody spoke a word to the man when he was on our set. I talk about that in the book. Wow. Um, he was gracious enough to come do the show, but only under his, uh, <laughs> only if he felt like it when he woke up that day. That's pretty much how it all happened. Wow. And so we had his lines on cue cards. We had the set sitting there for a couple of days. We had extras who would come in every day in the hopes that this was the day Frank would show up. You know? And right. so it's a funny story. And Jane missed the whole thing because she was too busy putting on lipstick to look good for him. By the time she showed up on the set, he was already home. Uh, oh my God! Yeah. So no, he he and he intimidated he intimidated Richard and he intimidated Don too. I will say that everybody. Really? Knows. I was gonna say that Don just bust his balls the entire time he's on set, or just once. He 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 came in and said, "What do you want me to do?" And he said, uh, "Just stand there. We'll stick a camera on you and hope to God you're not drooling all over yourself." That's what he <laughs> and, uh, um, but Richard Richard had a whole list of photos he wanted taken with Sinatra. You know, Tim, both of them doing the scream pose that Richard oh does, God. and then one shot with both of them with jackets over their shoulders. The only picture right. they got was 
with Frank as he walks to his car. One shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, wow. That's incredible. Yeah, well, George, George C. Scott intimidated me on the taps. We were scared to death of him. Um, and uh, that was a whole other thing. With uh, if, if you don't know that movie, it's a great movie. I do it's know. Like, I, I do know Taps. I do know that movie well. Military Academy. It, it, yep. Back then, it was a movie that starred George C. Scott and Timothy Hutton. Now it's known yep. as a movie that stars Sean Penn and Tom Cruise. And Tom Cruise, yeah. yeah. And and that uh, was that was fun. That was uh, it was a ball working on that too. But uh, but George C. Scott film. scared us. <laughs> he scared us. Wow. It was just because of who he was, or just because he, yeah. of how he acted on set. There was such a, you know, he had such, he, he, he was patent all the time. He was just patent. right, right. And he, yeah, had, he, he had a guy that he paid to go on movie sets with him to mm -hmm. play chess with him when he wasn't filming. So we never got a chance to talk to the man. He was either filming or playing chess with some guy, and then he left. I think he shot his stuff in a, a week or something, and he was gone. That's but, incredible. Um, but it was it was crazy. It was crazy. Yeah, I heard that uh, uh, Tom Cruise couldn't do some of the. Uh, like the the uh, the workout scenes or what? Like he just wasn't like I guess as fit as the other. Like he was kind of slower than the other guys were, or whatever that was. They were kind of. Uh, I may have read that on an IMDb trivia thing, by the way. I have no I idea, but that's, well, that's not true. Oh, okay, uh, okay. This is, this was Tom's second movie. First movie he did a little bit part in a Brooke Shields movie. Uh, I don't even remember. Endless Love or something like that. Mm -hmm. And this one he was supposed to play a smaller role, and we had mm -hmm. a. a I think it was a four week rehearsal process where they taught us all the rifle drills and the, and the military parade and all that stuff. We had to know it as well as the cadets because wow. we took part in the parades with them and stuff. And, uh, and I had to learn all the radio stuff cause I was bug ran the radio. Uh -huh. Um, and during the rehearsal process, they realized that Tom and Donald Kimmel needed to switch roles. So Don, who had, who was a very good actor, he just had a, a different take on it. Mm -hmm. He became the, the, the sub subordinate role, and and Tom suddenly was catapulted into the third, fourth lead of the f film. Oh wow! And uh, and he was terrific. He really was terrific. And I we I don't know who I was with, but we were hidden up in the in the rafters watching that final scene where Tom's got the machine gun. Yeah. And watching him do that, I, you knew as I'm watching it being filmed that this guy was going. He was going somewhere. You know. Wow. He was fantastic. I got, I got even with him once. Um, uh, I'll tell this story. It's short. At Sean and Madonna's wedding. Um, how, how often do you get to start with that? <laughs> I know. I was like mind blown. <laughs> At Sean and Madonna's <laughs> wedding, uh, mm -hmm. I was invited, and I had just. I, I take much more credit for this than I deserve, but I, I put together a film called At Close Range that Sean starred in with. Christopher Walken. Someone had sent me, make a long story short, someone had sent me the script trying to get it to my brother to get it to Bruce Springsteen so they could use okay. it to try and sell the film. I don't do that, so I didn't do that. But I had read the script and went, Sean, you need to option this and star in it. This is fantastic. Right. Sold him on that. He was going to play the lead and I was going to play the small role. Mm -hmm. So it came time to shoot the film and suddenly I was told I was too old for the film for, to play that role. Mm -hmm. So it is, you know, those things happen, whatever. So I'm now at, at Sean and Madonna's wedding, and uh, this guy comes up, and I'm talking to Tom Cruise, and uh, this guy walks up, older guy, and I said, oh, how do, you know, how do you know Sean? He said, oh, I just did a film for him. I said, oh, really? What role did you play? And he mentions the role I was supposed to play. And Tom mm -hmm. looks at this guy who looks older than I do, and he starts laughing at me because I got screwed out of my role, and this guy got the job, you know? Right. So, so at the end of the night, uh, Tom comes to me and he says, Billy, can you drive me to my car? I didn't want to park out here because of the paparazzi. They've been bo bothering me. I parked a couple of miles away and I took a cab here. And mm -hmm. can you drive me to my car? And I said, sure. I don't want the paparazzi to bother you. That's fine. So I said, here's what I'll do. I'll get in my car. I'll signal to you. You come out. You jump in the car and we'll drive away. And he said, great. Uh -huh. So I get my car. I signal to him. He comes out. And I took off before I could get into my car. <laughs> so he was stuck there. With all the paparazzi, you know, snapping away at him. Oh and, my God! And, but I thought, oh, laugh at me, will you? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Do you think he knew why you did it? Oh yeah, we called. We, uh, talked, we talked about it afterwards. He thought it was funny. That's but, hilarious. Uh, he he ended up jumping in the the next limo that came up, and it happened to be Andy Warhol's limo. <laughs> and, and he said, Holy "No shit. one." 
no one in the in the car even talked to him. They just stared at him. He said like I was a painting <laughs> until they got to his car and then he got out. Nobody even said a word to him. It was creepy. Oh my god. It was a That's crazy amazing. Thing. It was a crazy wedding, I'll say that. Yeah, you, you, the minute you said that, my brain just went. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, who just drops that casually? That's crazy. I, I'll let you go. I'll do one more question, then I'll let you, and then I'll let you uh, get out of here. Um, so I just had a, I just had a guest on from a band who plays with their brother all the time. Do you have any? And they're and they're both kind of famous, you know, whatever. And they and they stuck together. Do you have simple sibling, sibling rivalry stuff since you're both kind of in the same business and that kind of stuff? Anything that you guys uh, or you guys like looking at each other like, can you believe where we are? <laughs> no, you know what? I I was the actor, he was the musician, and the two of us never crossed paths wow. until the Sopranos came up, and that came out of the blue. I was on the oh. golf course with him and my father, and he got a phone call from David Chase, and I remember him going, "You want me to what? You want me to do what?" <laughs> and so eventually, he ended, ended up on that, and I, I've been I'm thrilled for him. I think he's great at what he does. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, he, no, we're, we're each other's biggest fan. Oh, I that's think. awesome. Unless, unless he's a complete liar, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> he, he just, he just, he's written his uh, autobiography, uh, which, uh, unrequited infatuations is coming out in September, I think. So we'll find out if I'm even mentioned in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Half the time he reads, you... I think he's an only child. You know? <laughs> if you're not, I'll have you both on, and you guys can reconcile yeah, that on air. Nice. Um, that'd be good. That'd be no, amazing. No, we're, we're thrilled. Uh, I'm thrilled for him. And, uh, That's so cool. There are times. There are times. I mean, look at some of his credits. There's sometimes I feel like you know he, I'm Solieri, Solieri to Mozart, and after a while, it's like, well, come on, give me a break, will you? Yeah. Oh, that's incredible, man. Well, seriously, thank you so much for coming on and staying on with me. It was it, truly a joy, and I have a million more questions, so maybe you'll come on again and I can pick your brain. And I'll come on again and, and sell my book again. Sell your book again. And I'll, I'm, I'll, by that time, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm going to grab a copy of that, and it's it's a fantastic uh, – uh, the stories in there must be amazing, and I can't wait to, to read it and check yeah. it out. I love the artwork, by the way. That's another thing I wanted to ask you. Who Do you know who did the artwork? I do know. This is a guy, Tom Cheswick. Okay. Uh, I, went to, I went to high school and junior high with him, and he used to draw caricatures of me back then. Oh my and, god! And I, he, he ended. Up, he's a writer, and he, he wrote for the Asbury Park Press and a bunch of other things. Oh. And I, I, I called him when I was putting the book together, and I said, "I want you to do this." He said, "I don't do that anymore." I said, "I want you to do it." And he, <laughs> he fought me on this, and he finally went, "Hey, here, this is the best I can do. Everybody loves it." Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful artwork. I love, yeah. When I saw it, I was like, that's amazing. And I, I, yeah. I just, you know, appreciate well, I had to give him the plug. That's great. And thanks awesome. for having me on. This was fun. No, th no problem, man. Thank you for coming on. I'll see you soon. All right. Take care. Dystopia tonight.